All right, pleased to welcome all of you to the annual meeting of the Wings Club Foundation. I'm Scott Donnelly, and I'm still, for the moment, the president of the Wings Club Foundation. I want to start by saying it's been an honor to be the president of the club. It's been a great year, very successful with the foundation, and uh, the whole team has done a terrific job. It's my pleasure to introduce some of the individuals who have worked so hard to make it a great year. We're fortunate to have many members of the Board of Governors here with us. I hope you have an opportunity to meet them. Uh, either already have or at the uh, reception afterwards. I want to ask each of you to stand as I call your name. We have Marion Blakey, the President and CEO of Rolls-Royce North America. All right, but she's the only one that gets applause, though. <laughs> as she should. Nope, I didn't. I, it was on purpose that I didn't invoke that rule until after Marion. Bob Kraft, the Foundation Council partner, Holland and Knight. I do that because no one, no one stands and claps for the general counsel, so you want to put some air cover. David Davenport, the Executive Vice President of Flight Safety International. Sharon DeVivo, President of Vaughn College. Matt Green, Executive Vice President of Safe Flight Instrument. Greg Hall, Senior Vice President, Air Safety and Business Operations of FedEx Express. Jim Jacobs, President, JWJ Advisors. Todd Kalman, President, TK Advisor Services. Gary Krauthammer, President, Krauthammer & Associates. Huntley Lawrence, Director of Aviation, the Port Authority of New York and New Jersey. Oh, may not be here just yet, okay. Bob Leekites, Executive Vice President and Customers of Airbus Americas. Jeff Mihalik, Vice President of Fleet and Material Services of Delta Airlines. Frank Prey, Managing Director of Alinda Capital Partners. Howard Rubel, Vice President of Investor Relations of General Dynamics. I haven't seen Howard yet tonight. Doug Walker, Managing Director of Seabury Consulting and Corporate Advisory. We're also honored to have a number of past presidents of the Wings Club. Um, we appreciate their continued support of the foundation as president emeritus. I want to please have them please stand and be recognized. Bob Aronson, chairman of Propeller Airports. Barry Eccleston, retired chief executive officer of Airbus Americas. John Farron, vice president of business development of marketing, L3 Technologies. Ken Gazzola, president emeritus of Aviation Week and president of Four Stars Aviation. Mary Ellen Jones, Vice President of Sales, the Americas, Pratt & Whitney. <laughs> Jeff Niddle, Chairman and CEO of Airbus Americas. <laughs> and Bruce Whitman, President and CEO of Flight Safety International. <laughs> We're also pleased to welcome a number of students this evening. Joining us are the students from the Aviation Club at NYU. Also here are students from the City University of New York. Welcome and we hope you enjoy tonight's program. I also want to thank the Wings Club staff for all their hard work over the year, Tom Fitzsimmons, Harvey Cohen, and Leigh McDougall. Thank you very, very much. I also want to thank Candace Adams Kimmel and Marie Rosa and the team at Adams Unlimited for all their support in putting these meetings together. Thank you very much. So I'm pleased to report that the Wings Club Foundation is in good health and well positioned for future growth. Enthusiasm for the club remains very high both our individual and corporate memberships are at record levels. Our monthly luncheons continue to be extremely successful, very well attended, and we continue to have a great slate of speakers um, for the club. The Aerospace on Campus program presented in partnership with Aviation Week continues to grow. The pro program highlights both technical and management careers in our aviation industry. To date, the Wings Club executives have made presentations to nearly 1,400 college students across both the United States and the United Kingdom. We're also making good progress on building our endowment. Through the President Society program, the Wings Club Foundation has attracted $5 million in donations and pledges, and we're very grateful for all of you who have contributed and supported this program. I think it's per particularly important, even though Dave is not here tonight, to, uh, to thank Dave. Dave Barger uh, was the Advancement Committee, is the Advancement Committee Chairman, 
and really is the, was the driving horse force behind starting this endowment, which has now reached, as we said, a $5 million level. So Dave, thank you very, very much for the leadership and inspiration that you provide. Uh, we hope the success of all these programs will continue uh, to serve the club well into the future, and I want to thank the Board of Governors and the entire membership for all your support. It has been a privilege to, and an honor to serve as the Wings Club President, and we now have a short video that captures the year in review. So we can go ahead and roll the tape. It's a great privilege and my, my, my first task is to acknowledge and thank Mary Ellen for a fabulous job in the past year and her leadership of our club. <laughs> there you are, right there. And I will work every day to continue to endeavor to be worthy of your recognition and to be worthy of those who have come before me because truly we fly on the wings of those giants to be worthy to inspire those who will come after me. Thank you. And one of the things that I think makes this room so much fun to be part of this club is this, you know, kind of merger between technology, safety, globalization, finance, and there's just no industry quite like this in terms of the, in the high stakes. And it just makes it that much more interesting and competitive and fun. You know, strategy, yeah, super important. That's great. You need to get it right. Vision, really important. You need to be able to communicate it repeatedly. Um, timing, really important. But actually, when you cut to the chase on it, the number one thing that I've learned is that your culture and the values of your organization are the difference between success and failure. So, um, so since then, so Embraer really uh, took over, uh, took off, so we could uh, develop the ERJ 145 family. Um, many of, of you here were right involved in this, uh, in this project, either in financing or providing uh, engines or leasing the aircraft, so we, uh, we are seeing here many players in this, uh, in this program. What comes next? Not this. This was actually the original Lear 23 and was a great airplane at the time. But Bill Lear was saying, why put a lavatory on this? I don't have a lavatory in my car. As I, I've shared with others in the past, I do own three millennials and I haven't figured them out yet. But uh, <laughs> so look. Be it for me to uh, tell you how we're going to run our business based on a millennial demographic, but there, it, it's it's a different generation. It's a generation that, that that values authenticity, it values transparency. Obviously, with technology being its native uh, language, growing up around it. interesting that we were having this sort of life-altering decision about going forward where our company was going to be focused in the next, you know, the next uh, time period because what the team didn't know and what I had been on for a couple of weeks was on a list for a heart transplant. And the morning, that morning, that very first morning, which it happened to be my birthday by the way, uh, you don't make this stuff up, I'm telling you, <laughs> a doctor had called and said, we've got a kick-ass heart for you. 
So what's the answer? Changing the dynamic in our industry requires the reintroduction of choice for the consumer. And the best way of achieving this is for policymakers to create opportunities for smaller airlines and new entrants to challenge the dominance of the largest airlines. It's easy to see how you can use Dubai as the hub around which you can build a branded presence in the engineering space in a region that for us stretches all the way from the Levant on one side to the Malaysian Peninsula on the other side. You know, first of all, I think, you know, all of us who work in aerospace are, are very lucky. Uh, you know, we've had a, a chance to, to impact the lives of many people. Uh, the way the world works and certainly the way the world is connected, we've had a lot to do with making the world a better place. And it's an industry that's enabled growth, it's encouraged innovation, it's enhanced understanding, and it's expanding also our horizons of discovery. Well, one of your competitors, Doug Parker, had a great, great interesting quote the other day. You know the quote, I know we're never going to lose money again. Pretty bold statement. It's, it's uh, very bold. I'm not going to be that bold. <laughs> uh, I think American might lose money again. That was a joke. <laughs> oh, people. Amy Curtis, I'll just shout out Amy, because Amy's the one that came up with the JetBlue name. So if you ever think that I did that, I did not. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it was Amy, and it was on a phone call late Friday night. We kept it from being named uh, True Blue. That was the name. And we said, no, that's a frequent flyer program. So. I'd like to introduce to you uh, the president of the Wings Club Foundation, the chairman and chief executive officer of Textron. Ladies and gentlemen, your president tonight, Scott Donnelly. Well, good evening, everyone, and welcome to the uh, Wings Club Foundation uh, annual gala. On behalf of the Board of Governors, I welcome everybody and thank you so much for being here tonight. So this year, I'm pleased to say that I've been able to find one of our own an aviation enthusiast, licensed pilot, type certificated, flies his own citation jet. Let me assure you, this pilot can sing. Please join me in welcoming Mr. Dirks Bentley. Let's have a little fun tonight. Look closely at these youngsters, ladies and gentlemen. They are the future. Uh, this is $25,000 contribution to help you and your team continue to do the great work that you do. Thank, Thank you so you very, so very much. much. Thank you so much, Scott. Uh, good e evening, everybody, and thank you uh, uh, so much um, I want to thank the Wings Club, first of all, uh, for everything that the Wings Club does. I'm very proud to be a member. Southwest is proud to be a member of the Wings Club. There are past uh, Distinguished Achievement Award winners here, and uh, just looking at the list, uh, just an amazing list of, of personal heroes, and certainly uh, none bigger in my mind than, than Herb Kelleher. But I also just want to thank everybody here for what you do. Uh, to support aviation, to drive aviation, to propel us forward. It is just so important, uh, not just uh, in terms of the economy uh, and jobs, but just in terms of what we can do for the world. So thank you all for everything that you do for aviation. I thank you all for this amazing, amazing award and recognition. Thank you. Well, as, as I said, it was a very eventful year and a great year in many, many regards. So now uh, we need to get on to the business matters for tonight's meeting. Uh, Tom, please advise whether or not we have a quorum. 
Still tallying stuff back there. Okay, we do. That's good news. Our first order of business is to approve the minutes of the previous annual meeting held on March 29th, 2017. Copies of the meeting minutes are available at the registration table. I need to have a motion to approve those minutes. A second? All in favor? Aye. Anybody opposed? Very good. Thank you. The committee chairmen have prepared annual reports of their activities. These reports are now presented collectively as the annual report of the foundation. In the annual report, there's also my letter summarizing our accomplishments for the year. The annual report is also available here tonight at the registration table. In addition, copies of the audited financial statements and the foundation tax returns are available as well. Can I have a motion to approve the annual report? A second. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Thank you very much. All right, the governance committee, chaired by Frank Prey, has nominated the following members of the Board of Governors to serve three-year term. Marion Blakey, Shaker Sharor, Sharon DeVivo, Elise Eberwine, James Myler, Abdul Moberry, and Howard Rubel. The following members have been nominated to serve on the Board of Governors for a two-year term beginning on March 20, 2018. Rick Derlou and Isain Munir. The following are the new nominations for three-year terms on the Board of Governors. Their bios are available at the reception table as well. John Brogan, President and Chief Executive Officer of USAIG. Barry Butler, the President of Embry-Riddle Aeronautical University. Ali Lamadandi, uh, Chief Executive Officer of ABL Aviation. And Christian Shearer, Chief Executive Officer of ATR. Are there any further nominations from the floor? There being none, I will now close the nominations. Can I have a motion to elect these candidates to serve on the board? A second? All in favor? Opposed? Very good, thank you, they're moved. We'll now move to the report on the new Golden Eagles. In 1990, the Board of Governors voted to establish a category of membership, one that would recognize and honor those longtime members who have given and continue to give their support to the Wings Club. Members of this honorary group, whose combined length of time in the club and life are equal to or greater than 120 years for men and 95 years for women, also to be known as Golden Eagles. The difference in the criteria for men and women is that as there were no women prior in the club prior to 1970, we've spotted the women 25 years. There are three Golden Eagle nominations this year. Tom Donegan, who was first elected in 1974, Clay Lacey in 1982, and Denise Richards in 1987. We're very fortunate to have Tom with us tonight. I invite him to come up to the podium for the presentation of his Golden Eagle pins and certificate. Tom, come on up. Unfortunately, Clay and Denise are not able to be here tonight, and their certificates and pins will be mailed to them directly. All right, if there are any other Golden Eagles in attendance, would you please stand so we can recognize you for your long and valuable support to the club? That's terrific, thank you. Thank you very much for being here tonight. It is now my pleasure to introduce Ken Gazzola, Chairman of the Historical and Education Committee and past president of the Wings Club, to introduce this year's Outstanding Aviator Award. Ken, please come on up. Scott and good evening. Thanks for joining us this evening. As many of you have been here before, you know what this program is all about. 
Tonight, the Wings Club, and once again in cooperation with the International Aviation Women's Association, is honored to present its ninth annual, its ninth annual Outstanding Aviator Award. The award was created to recognize aviators whose actions made major contributions to aviation or aviation safety and will serve as a leadership role model for all of us. Tonight, we are proud to honor Major General Patrick H. Brady. Our honoree will join a stellar roster of aviators previously recognized. Many of you have been here for those awards. The Tuskegee Airmen, they were our first. The Wasps, the Doolittle Raiders, Patty Wagstaff, Bob Hoover, Susanna Darcy Henneman, Ed Rock, who was a wild weasel pilot, and last year, Heather Penny, if you remember, the F-16 pilot who flew on 9-11. And thanks to our friends at Iowa, she was a gracious recipient. Just in case you don't know, each year we alternate. Iowa selects a lady, and we select a man. Seems a little segregated, but we, we get there. <clears throat> there aren't enough superlatives tonight to describe the bravery, hero heroism, and self-sacrifice of General Brady. He has an amazing career and amazing accomplishments. As a dust-off pilot in Vietnam, he completed over 2,500 combat missions and saved over 5,000 wounded. It's not 500, that's 5,000. He received the Medal of Honor for conspicuous gallantry and intrepidity in action at the risk of life and above all, above, above, the, above the line of duty. He did it for a series of rescues during which he used three helicopters to rescue over 60 wounded. His aircraft during this mission the three of them endured over 400 holes from enemy fire and mines during these rescues. Thank you, Boeing, I gather. I believe that General Brady is the most decorated veteran living today, and that says a lot. As many have said, the Vietnam War was a helicopter war, and General Brady is the personification of a helicopter pilot. And what he endured spells it out for all of us. <clears throat> I would like to extend special thanks to the American Veterans Center, which sponsored the film, and Liam Neeson, a true patriot, for narrating. So tonight, before presenting the award, we are honored to have two distinguished friends of General Brady to say a few words. And they promised to make it only a few words. Jack? Okay. The, they are truly heroes among themselves. And Major General Carl McNair, U.S. Army, recipient of four Distinguished Flying Crosses. And Colonel Jack Jacobs, U.S. Army, recipient of the Medal of Honor. Gentlemen, would you join me? By the way, according to rank, the general will go first. Thank you very much. <laughs> wow, what a great evening. What distinguished aviators you are. I've been flying for over 62 years. I won't tell you how old I am, but it's one of the greatest privileges a young man or woman can have today is to serve our nation and wear the silver wings of an Army aviator, Air Force pilot, Navy or Marine Corps golden wings, and of course even our Coast Guard. Pat Brady is a hero to all of us. By background, I became the first chief of the Army Aviation Branch back in 1983. It's been 35 years this year that we've had our own aviation branch. Heretofore, it was controlled by eight different branches of the Army, artillery, infantry, etc. They all had their own particular types of helicopters. But to get total synergism of the force, 
Chief of Staff of the Army, suggested that we study this problem and become a unified, one single branch. And Pat Brady is probably the most decorated and perhaps one of the most famous Army aviators that we have. And during Vietnam, we trained over 40,000 pilots. We were training 600 pilots a week. Think about that. We, in fact, trained enough to man our forces for many years to pass. Today, they train about 500 a year, which is, in fact, the state of readiness. So, Pat, we're, we're so proud of you. I'd just like to say one thing, and that is, in Pat's time and day, he, in fact, continues to become you know, our most decorated aviator in the United States Army. The other thing that I think we should all consider is the 5,000 lifts that he made. History has written, and we have it documented, we moved over 870,000 medevacs by dust-off during the Vietnam conflict. That was our own wounded soldiers, the prisoners of war as well, and the civilian casualties that they had. When I was the chief of the branch, we had our motto, above the best. And of course, today, soldiers in Afghanistan, Iraq, and all over the world don't go outside the wire without having a top cover. And the motto today is if we don't fly, soldiers die. Pat, we salute you. I've known Pat Brady a long time. We were decorated together in the same ceremony 49 years ago. Uh, and at the time, I thought that Pat was the oldest guy who ever lived. He was a major in the United States Army, old and decrepit. He was 33 years old. Uh, the first dinner we attended, which was the night that after the ceremony, we went down to Houston. And uh, at the time, there were almost 400 living recipients of the Medal of Honor. Today, there are 71. And among the people in, at the dinner were the likes of Pappy Boynton, and uh, Jimmy Doolittle, and at my table, sitting to my right, was Eddie Rickenbacker. That was a long time ago. Um, and we've known each other now for very nearly 50 years. Um, when he's had too much to drink, and he's hanging around with the likes of Bruce Crandall, uh, Pat's, uh, as something of a joke, will tell Bruce and other aviators, that he, Pat Brady, is the greatest living aviator. But the 5,000 soldiers whose lives Pat saved will tell you that's no joke. Thank you, Pat, for being my friend and my hero for 49 years. What a, Pat, what a support team you've got. <clears throat> now, uh, thank you both. It was eloquent and very appropriate for Pat's achievements. Now I'd like to introduce Mylene Milan Skolik. Milan is a board member of the International Aviation Women's Association and managing director of ICF Aviation. She will join me in presenting the award. Here she is. Okay. Thank you, Ken. Um, what an honor every year it is for Iowa to jointly present with the Wings Club uh, this uh, Outstanding Aviator Award. Uh, as Ken mentioned, every other year we do select a woman. It's going to be very hard for us to match tonight's <laughs> recipient, but we have something that we're preparing. So thank you to the Wings Club board. Thank you for, uh, to Iowa's uh, board. Many of you are here. Tonight, many of you are on both boards, Mary Ellen Jones and Sharon DeVivo and Marion Blakey, so thank you. Um, we started many years ago, and the first uh, recipients we had were the WASP, and we had, it was a great start. We were try trying to match the Tuskegee Airmen, so that was, uh, that was interesting. Iowa is celebrating uh, their 30th anniversary, and our next annual conference will be in um, Memphis, Tennessee in October. Uh, we are hosting many events and many receptions all over the world. 
Uh, we were in Dublin yesterday with Aviation Week. Um, we're going to be in Singapore with iStat. Uh, we are going to be in Montreal with IKO and ACI. And we're going to be at the IATA AGM in Sydney. And it's a big deal because we'll have a reception. And we managed to convince uh, IATA to have 20 minutes on gender diversity. Uh, in front of 250 airline CEO, and I will jointly be presenting with um, Quanta CEO Alan Joyce, who's a big um, proponent of gender diversity. So it's uh, by organizing all these events, our mission is really to try to empower, encourage, inspire, make us stronger to sit at the table, to be on boards, to be. Um, a little bit um, at the higher level. I always wonder if we are effective and if we are succeeding, there are more women in aviation, there are more women pilots, but we're not there yet. So I would encourage you all to try to support women in your groups, take them, ask them to take the next difficult assignment, ask them to really step up and encourage them, sponsor them so that we can see more of us here. Uh, the woman we bring at those uh, at this joint event from Captain Darcy Heinemann to Heather Penny have all the skills, all the courage, and all the strengths that <clears throat> women need to be leaders and to inspire us. Thank you. Yep. You can hold the award. Okay. And <clears throat> to demonstrate women power. We have a retired general here tonight, uh, U.S. Army. General, Brigadier General Myron Williamson. Could you stand, please? <laughs> nice to have you here. General, would you join us, please? <clears throat> General Brady, on behalf of the Wings Club and the International Aviation Women's Association, we're proud to present you with the ninth annual Wings Club Outstanding Aviator Award. Congratulations. Thank you. Congratulations. It's an honor. <laughs> Let me get my spontaneous remarks. Jack, uh, uh, you know, the Medal of Honor Society is unique. We have all branches, all races, all religions, just a melting pot of America. And uh, Jack, of course, is unique because he's the first and only Medal of Honor recipient who is also a proud midget. <laughs> <laughs> I love to hear uh, what a fine fellow I am. I wish my wife could be here to hear what a fine fellow I am. But more than that, I wish my wife's mother could be here to hear what a fine <laughs> fellow I am. You know, speaking of wives, uh, we traveled a lot. All you folks out there who are veterans know that we traveled a lot, we were gone. She used to get a little upset with me. I come home and she said, oh, you're going again. And uh, I said, well, get a hobby. For God's sakes, quit picking on me. So I come back from a trip and I say, dear, did you get a hobby? Yes, I did get a hobby. What are you gonna do? I'm gonna raise chickens. She's a city girl, I'm a country guy, show me. Well, sure enough, she's got two roosters and one hen. And I said, dear, I think you missed the point. She says, no, you missed the point. One of those roosters travels a lot. <laughs> now, speaking of, uh, of veterans, uh, I see we got a lot of old veterans out there. You remember that stuff? They put in our food when we were young to keep us from chasing girls. It's starting to work. <laughs> I found, too, that uh, with veterans, uh, one of the first things uh, besides that that goes is the memory. And three friends of mine, Army guy, 
Navy guy, Air Force guy, lost their wives and they decided that they would live together, save money. And so one night, the Navy guy is upstairs getting ready to take a bath and he steps in the tub and he stops and he says, am I getting in the tub or am I getting out of the tub? The Air Force guy hears that and runs up the stairs to help, he gets halfway up the stairs and he says, Am I going up the stairs or am I going down the stairs? And the Marine guy is sitting down on the kitchen table shaking his head and he says, thank God, knock on wood, I'm not like, that. was that the front door or the back door? <laughs> and the other thing I found too that uh, keeping in shape after you retire is really a challenge. I remember my last run at the Presidio, the aide would knock on the door and we'd head out down by the tennis courts out toward and run across the uh, Golden Gate Bridge. And one day I'm running by the tennis court and a tennis ball rolls out. So I pick it up, run along a while. After a little bit, I slip it down the front of my shorts, keep running. About this time, some young lady comes in from the side, a young female soldier and says, can I join you, General? And I says, yes, as long as you keep the pace down. We run along, I notice she just keeps looking at my crotch. So I says, that's just a tennis ball. She says, well, don't feel bad, General. I had tennis elbow once and it went away. <laughs> I, was I was asked to talk about uh, combat, uh, my combat experiences and uh, tell some war stories. And you all know the difference between a war story and a fairy tale. Fairy tale begins once upon a time. The war story begins with, this is no shit. <laughs> so I'm going to tell you a war story. It's a true story, actually. Our job was to pick up the wounded from the battlefield. And uh, we kind of learned by trial and error and after a while, if you use your imagination and you kind of mix and mingle into your mind the terrain, the enemy situation, the friendly situation, what kind of weapons the enemy has, and you put that through your system, especially the terrain, a highway will just kind of spring out of the sky and take you into the area. And so one day we're out picking up a bunch of Marines. As is always the case with Marines. A lot of confusion down there. We got any Marines in here? Oh, good. <laughs> <laughs> and we slipped down into a dry river bed, down behind the trees, jumped up over the trees, sat down. You always turned your tail into the fire. Harder for the bullets to get through the transmission than it was to get through the, the uh, windshield. And always confusion. You look around, and people are shooting and shouting and screaming at you. Get the patience. Get the patience. And you know in a case like that, you know what it means to pucker. And puckering is when the cheeks from the lower part of your body slowly begin to envelop your ears. <laughs> and we're sitting there all part, you try to make yourself as small as you can. I look over at my co-pilot, he's all shrunk up and puckered, but his head's going like this all over the cockpit. Back to the patients, get them on, let's get out of here, and back to my friend. And there he is, his head's going like this. I couldn't help myself, I just broke down, I laughed out loud, but he missed a stroke. He said, laugh, you son of a bitch, but it's harder to hit a moving target. <laughs> That's a true story. <laughs> the, uh, the pilot with me that day, if you remember, someone stole a Huey and tried to fly it into the White House, and a Maryland police helicopter pilot stopped him and that was my co-pilot that day, and he, he never hears the end of that. Well, so much for the serious part of my remarks. <laughs> America has no kings or queens, but we have a nobility, and America's nobility is called veterans. And so I thought I'd talk about uh, some of the nobility that I have known and what we can learn from them. They say that all heroes must at last heroes must at last become bores, and the Medal of Honor Society has some programs to keep us 
from be being bores, our character development problem. I remember a boss one time, after I screwed something up really bad, he said, don't feel bad, Pat. No one is a total failure. They can always serve as a bad example. And so our job as, re as guys who have been kind of through the mill and had experiences is to be a bad example, to teach children to go around uh, and not, not make the same kind of mistakes we made. This character development program is kind of like the, the first tee program in golf uh, that the golfers use to teach honor, honor, honesty, honor, and integrity. And we use the medal. The medal is a symbol. Symbol comes from the Greek word which means half token, which when united with the other half represents something above and beyond itself. The American flag. The other half token of the American flag, Constitution, the Declaration. Burn the American flag, you burn the Constitution, the Declaration. The other half token of the medal, courage, sacrifice, and patriotism. And those are the messages that we try to take out to the, to the kids in the schools. Key to success in life, courage. It's the only way in which we are all born equal matters of courage. Key to success in life, you can't use it up. Where does it come from? I believe it's, it's a function of faith. It's the only thing I've ever been able to explain. Uh, and we use vignettes, by the way, to bring these stories out to the kids. Sacrifice. I think it's the key to happiness. Sacrifice is love in action. And the sacrifice the important sacrifice is a sacrifice with no bottom line, nothing, no quid pro quo. All it will do is increase your capacity for more sacrifice. And the greater your capacity for sacrifice is, the greater will be your capacity for leadership, for responsibility, indeed, I believe, for happiness itself. And the other thing we run into a lot with these kids is hero, who are their heroes and the difference between a hero and a celebrity. And I always tell the story of uh, Pappy Coleman to bring, this, bring out this thing about heroes. Celebrities are not always the kind of people. Hero, a celebrity is someone we might want to meet. A hero is someone we should want to be like. And Pappy was a medic with me in Vietnam uh, on one mission he took a bullet right through his lips. He fell down, he was bleeding. The crew chief jumped on him and says, Pappy, what can we do? And he says, not to worry, I just kissed the bullet that had my name on it. On his feet, back into the field to pull the wounded into the aircraft. Another, another mission, he jumped out of the aircraft, shot in the chest, chicken plate, knocked him down, got up, shot again, knocked him down, got up, killed the guy who was shooting at him, back in the field to get the patients. Another mission, he's with me in a minefield. Everybody's dead or wounded. Nobody will, wound, will move. Pappy into the minefield, pulling the patients onto my aircraft. Things are going pretty good. He steps on a mine. Well, the mine blew him up in the air, almost through my blades. I'm watching out the door. I thought, holy, sh if he hits the blades, we're stuck in the minefield. Fell down, pants were on fire, put it out, back into the minefield to get the patients and onto the aircraft. Now, Pappy, they call him Pappy, he's 25 years old, I think, and he had three silver stars, three purple hearts. He's in the aviation, Army Aviation Hall of Fame. Uh, could have been Sergeant Major of the Army. He had everything in the world going for him. He had 18 years, two years from a pension, and he gave it all up to go home and take care of his family. So why is Pappy a hero? He's a hero because he's a good person. We ought not to have any heroes who are also aren't good people, and that should be the essence of every one we designate as a hero. We found him, it took us 38 years to find him. 
and he was not well, <clears throat> and he's down. I took him to some conventions and stuff, and and then one night, uh, uh, after my beloved Spurs had just kicked Miami's ass for the national championship of basketball, I get a call from Pappy's wife, and she says he's dying, and he wants me to take care of his funeral. So, you know, I don't think he's really dying. I'm happy. Well, he died t two hours later. And uh, one of the great honors uh, was for me to take care of, to bury that great soldier. Problem was, he was being buried in Turkey Creek, Kentucky. They don't, by God, speak English in Turkey <laughs> Creek, Kentucky. And for me to get flags and uniforms and stuff to bury Pappy the way he ordered me to bury him was really a trick, but we got it done. The other thing that uh, we found as we go to these schools, and we've been doing this, Jack and I have been doing this for about 10, 10 or more years, is what is the basic fundamental thing that the teachers should be teaching these young people? Read and write and arithmetic. I think the most important thing is patriotism. You can't a democracy cannot survive unless we grow patriots, not people who say they love their country. Yeah, you know, we've heard enough of that. We need people who will support and defend their country in, in order for our country to survive. And when we teach the children, the young people about patriotism, I always tell the story of Webster Anderson, a great, powerful black soldier, artillery guy, He's on a mountaintop in Vietnam during a tropical storm. They're attacked by the communists. The initial attack, they pretty much took off both his legs. Still, he fought on. The next attack, they threw a hand grenade into his position, and Webster caught the hand grenade, and when he was throwing it clear of his position, it pretty much took off his arm. I flew in that night and picked up what was left of Webster and his wounded soldiers, and I took him to the hospital. Well, he lived. Miraculously, he lived. He was in shreds when we got him to the hospital, but they saved his life, he survived, and as a result of his actions, he got the Medal of Honor. He, th he thought I was saved his life. We became very, very close. The physician saved his life. And we would go to schools and talk to the kids. And one day we're in a school in Oklahoma, and uh, he was more plastic than he was flesh. And he had an arm with a cane on it and one good arm. And uh, we, he, we, he wouldn't sit down. He insisted on standing up to talk to the kids. And we prop him up, and uh, prosthesis not like they are today. And the kid raised his hand in the class, and he says, Mr. Anderson, knowing what you know now, that it would cost you two legs and one arm, would you do it again? Well, Webster raised his good arm and he says, kid, I only got one arm left, but my country can have it any time they want. Now this was a patriot and those young children sitting there watching this great black soldier, I'm sure will never forget what he said to them that day. But that's what we do in our character development program. And I understand we got some well-heeled guys out here and gals contribute to what we're doing. It's, it's uh, something that's needed, this, these things that we try to bring to these young people. And finally, to thank you for uh, this honor that you've given me this evening. Bob Hoover was a friend. What a character. And uh, I, I, I miss the guy. But the greatest thing about any award, any medal, anything like that, is that someone thought enough of you to do it. Someone was your grunt, as we say in the military. In my case, Bruce Whitman was my grunt. And so, Bruce, appreciate that. He's done 
so much for our character development program, for the Medal of Honor Society, and for everything that we try to do with these kids. Couldn't do it without men like him, and we're deeply appreciated, appreciate very much the help that he's given us, and we'll keep going until we hit every state in the union. So once again, thank you for this great honor. God bless you. Take care. Uh, so one of the very special events, the Wings Club, in the annual uh, is the annual gala. Each year, as you know, at the annual gala, we honor a member of the industry uh, with the Wings Club Distinguished Achievement Award. The award honors an individual who exhibits outstanding accomplishments in the field of aviation and aeronautics. We are very pleased to announce this evening that the selection for this year's award winner is Willie Walsh. Willie, as many of you know, is the Chief Executive Officer of International Airlines Group. He has a long and distinguished career in the industry and is certainly deserving of this prestigious award. We all look forward to honoring Willie at the gala on Friday, October the 19th. Uh, the gala will again be held at the New York Hilton in Midtown, and we hope you can all make it. With that, my reign of terror comes to a close as the president of your club, and it is now my great pleasure to invite Frank Prey, the new Wings Club Foundation president, to join me at the podium. It's my pleasure to present you with this gavel and wish you nothing but the best and, of course, all the support and for a great year. Thank you very, Thank much. You very much, Frank. I will turn this over to you. And I just need you for a second. And I brought my own notes. Um, so first, I'd like to acknowledge and thank... This is the thank... point where Mary Ellen started. <laughs> yes, that's right. When I was here last year. And you know this is going to be recorded. <laughs> um, I'd like to acknowledge and thank Scott for his efforts and leadership during uh, his year as president. Um, as an actual expression of the Foundation's appreciation, we're presenting Scott with a commemorative Wings Club President's plaque. Uh, the inscription will read, presented to Scott Donnelly, in grateful appreciation for your dedicated service as president, 2017 to 2018, the Wings Club Foundation, New York City, March 28, 2018. I'd like to express my sincere appreciation for being elected. It's a, uh, an honor and a privilege to serve as president of the Wings Club Foundation. Uh, through the hard work of all my predecessors, the foundation is in a very solid position. Our objective for the upcoming year is to continue to refine and improve on the many programs that we already have underway. Our particular focus will be the rollout of the SIM program which provides scholarships, internships, and mentorships to promising aviation students. The Wings Club currently awards eight annual student scholarships. We will be reviewing opportunities to expand our scholarship program to additional aviation-oriented universities. The Wings Club will also continue to recognize and make grants to organizations who use aviation to help those in need. Another key initiative will be to increase the Wings Club Foundation's visibility to new markets and members outside the New York area. We will be expanding our international events and potentially adding new regional events in the United States. Last fall, we held our inaugural, inaugural uh, Dubai luncheon. The event was very well received. So on April 18th, we look forward to hosting our first aviation series luncheon in Tokyo, Japan. We're also exploring other strategic regional locations. We're looking forward to an exciting year at the Wings Club Foundation. We're very fortunate to have talented leaders and engaged membership. With our combined efforts, we are sure to be successful. Is there any old business? No old business. New business. I would now like to announce and request board approval of the committee chairs for the years 2018-2019. I will read out the names. Advancement Committee, David Davenport and Mary Ellen Jones. Awards, Jeff Nettle. Executive, chaired by the chairman, uh, chaired by the president. 
Finance, Todd Coleman. Governance, Chris Kabasic. Historical and Educational, Ken Gazzola. Membership, Matt Green and Don Hickton. Program, Bob Lee Kites. Regional events, chaired by the President. Scholarship, Elise Eberwein and Greg Hamilton. Can I have a motion to approve this slate? Can I have a second? All in favor? All oppo any opposed? The committee chairs are approved. I would like to now remind everybody about tomorrow's monthly luncheon. Our feature speaker will be Stephen Cavanaugh, Chief Executive Officer of Aer Lingus. I look forward to seeing you all there. And the next annual meeting will be held on Wednesday evening, March 27, 2019. So please mark your calendars. Now I want to invite everybody here to stay for an open house reception, which follows immediately after adjournment. Can I have a motion to adjourn the meeting? We stand adjourned. <laughs>